It's November 20th, 1932. A 40-year-old gangster is finishing up dinner with his family when someone knocked on the door. One of his family members opened the door and it was Philip Cooper, the gangster's lawyer, and he had a portable typewriter with him. The day before, the gangster told his lawyer that he needed the typewriter. Two of his brothers had been killed and he knew who did it and he was going to expose them. Then the gangster sat down at the desk and started to type. I was a bigger man than Al Capone in Underworld Power, but I quit because I didn't believe in putting boys on the spot. Then there was another knock at the door. This one was louder, more aggressive. His father opened the door to find three men who identified themselves as police officers. They said, we want to talk to Frank. Frank was Antonio Francis Fabrizio, better known as Tony the Wop. And before Abe Ellis and Joe Valachi, Tony was setting up to be the first to blow the lid off of organized crime. Hey, you guys, guys and bums. Welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about another trio of brothers who were wiped out due to their criminal lifestyle. Like the Shapiros and the Ambergs, the Fabrizios were contemporaries of Abe Rellis, Ben Siegel, Louis Lepke, and Maya Lansky. And all but Hyman Amberg would be killed by them indirectly or by their own hands. But first, we got some business to discuss. If you're new here and you like what we're doing over here at A Few Bad Men and you want to get your button, you want to join the gang, first thing you got to do is you got to bump off that subscribe button and leave them in the gutter. Second thing you got to do is you got to break that thumb because he owes us money. The third thing you got to do is you got to ring that bell and set it for all notifications so you don't miss nothing. Right? And if you want to slide an envelope upstairs to the boss to help the channel run smooth, the link is down below. All right? So, let's get into this. Anthony Tony the Wap was the oldest of the Fabrizio brothers, and he was born in 1892, followed by Louis, known as Louis the Wap, who was born in 1898, and Andrew, born around 1907. They grew up in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, right near the bridge. Over his 40 years, Tony the Wap became a lifelong criminal. His rogues gallery number was 23,295, and he received his first pinch in 1907 for burglary under the name of Charles Cabrisi. Actually, this guy had a lot of aliases and he was hard to track down, but you can't hide from the boss. I'm going to find you. He was sentenced to Elmira for two years. In 1909, he was arrested for felonious assault after throwing a knife at a man, but the charges were dropped. In 1910, he was convicted of grand larceny and sent to Sing Sing for three years. When Tony got out in 1913, he came home to a raging gang war between the Bay Cat Levy gang and the John Ciccarelli gang. Now, I'm not sure which side Tony was on, but I can guess by the names that he was on the Italian side. By January 1913, three murders had already been attributed to the few. Back in the summer of 1912, Bay Cat Levy was shot in the side in front of the Plaza Grand Hall on Haven Meyer Street. On January 9th, 1913, he was playing cards in the Unity Club when someone came in and told him that he was wanted on the phone. Now, this is 1913, and the phone was down the street in the saloon. When he got to the saloon, there was no one on the other end. He asked, what's the deal? The bartender said that the person who called hung up, and Bearcat went back to the Unity Club. As he climbed the steps, shots rang out. From out of nowhere, a bullet struck Bearcat in the side, and he tumbled down the steps. He was taken to the Beth Israel Hospital, and during the surgery to save his life, the bullet couldn't be found, and the doctors believed that he would die. But he pulled through. In February 1913, John Ciccarelli was shot as he walked down Marcy Avenue by an unknown gunman. He survived. On May 2nd of 1913, Tony the Wap was walking to his house when shots rang out. A sniper shot Tony from a doorway and ran off. He was taken to the hospital and a bullet was removed from his shoulder. Four days later, a man named David Minza was walking in the Waynesburg Bridge Plaza on the Brooklyn side. It was around 5 p.m. and the place was crowded with thousands of people. Three of those people had their eyes on the 18-year-old Menza. As he strolled through the plaza on that spring day, Salvatore Andrello walked up to him, stuck a pistol in his left side, and shots rang out. The first shot passed through Menza's heart, and he dropped to the ground. To make sure he was dead, Andrello stood over him and pumped three more shots into his body before he and the others ran and tossed their guns into the gutter. Several police were on the scene and gave chase. Tony DeWap, along with Salvatore Andrello and Frank McQually, were arrested. Several witnesses say that they saw Tony pull the trigger, but he would eventually be acquitted. In November 1913, 
Tony DeWatt was sent back to Sing Sing for five years for possession of a deadly weapon. The police proved that he threw the gun when he ran after the men's shooting. On July 23rd, 1921, he was arrested for felonious assault, but he was acquitted. It seems like by the mid-20s, Tony DeWatt was working in the Frankie Yale organization, possibly as a dope man. The middle Fabrizio brother, Louis DeWatt, he was working alongside Little Augie Organ and Legs Diamond. And knowing that Legs and Augie were into the dope game, it's safe to say that he was in the dope business as well. By 1926, Tony DeWatt was one of the early dope dealers in the city. He had a fruit stand in lower Manhattan that sold, amongst other things, bananas. A guy would come and buy a bundle of bananas, take it around the corner, take the one marked banana, and give the rest to the neighborhood kids. Then he would take that one banana home, cut it open, and remove a vial of dope. On May 2nd, 1924, Louis DeWatt got into an argument in front of 63 Lewis Street when shots rang out. A gunman fired five times, hitting Lewis in the back and the right cheek, as well as wounding Abraham Steinholt, a tailor just minding his business in his store, in the leg. The gunman got into the wind, and Louis DeWatt was taken to Governor Hospital in critical condition. But when asked who shot him, he had nothing to say to the police. Four months before, little Augie Paisano was killed, and Lex Diamond was shot as they walked down Norfolk Street by Grover Shapiro. On May 24, 1928, Louis DeWatt was driving through the Lower East Side when he got a flat tire. He called for a garage man to come fix it. He waited at 2nd and B Avenue in Manhattan, and while he waited, he shot the breeze with his pal George Schwartz. Louis was bent down inspecting the tire when a taxi rolled up and three men got out and shots rang out. Six shots were fired. Two slugs ripped through the 25-year-old hoodlum, one in the back and another fatal shot to the right side of the head. As Schwartz stood stunned, the three killers hailed another cab and took off. This is what you call a cowboy hit. All right, these guys had no other way to get to the hit than a taxi and no exit plan but a taxi. Someone really wanted Louis DeWatt dead. Louis DeWatt was taken to Bellevue Hospital, but he expired on route. The car Louis was driving was owned by Rufiano Castellano. That name sounds familiar, right? It gets better. Philip Castellano was brought in for questioning for the murder, but was released. A year later, two more men, Fat Harry Selenik and Cowboy Larry Viscardi, were arrested for the murder, but no one was ever convicted of the crime. By the 30s, the youngest brother, Andrew Fabrizio, was well into his criminal career. He was running with two brothers, Vincent and Anthony Baccio. On February 17, 1932, Andrew was arrested with Vincent Baccio for running a protection racket. They went to the vest factory of Max Groomer to collect their weekly $50 for protection. They had been collecting this from Max since back in 1928. Back then, Max told him he didn't need protection. And then a few days later, he changed his mind after his factory was broken into and he had to pay 250 bucks to get his stuff back. 50 bucks a week looked like a pretty good deal then. But the depression saw dwindling in Max's profits and he could no longer afford to pay. But he was afraid, so he went to the cops. The police provided him with $50 in marked bills. When Vincent Baccio and Andrew Fabrizio walked in, he paid them and they left. When they walked outside, the cops were waiting. They were arrested and taken to the tombs, and in their possession was a list of other businesses that were under their protection. And the math says that they had pulled in over 10 grand in four years. By 1932, Andrew and the Baccio brothers were involved with Pretty Amberg and the Bug and Meyer gang. Like I said, the Bug and Meyer mob were heavy into the drug business. Their gang headquarters was a garage at 29 Avenue C. The garage housed the gang's trucks that they used to transport booze and it doubled as a car rental. Often gangsters would rent cars from the garage to handle business. On August 10th, 1932, Pretty Amber came to pick up Vincent Baccio from his home. They had a piece of work and they needed a car so they headed over to the Bug and Meyer garage in Manhattan. The garage was operated by Harry Buckbinder, a close friend of Maya Lansky and Ben Siegel. According to Vince's fiance, when Pretty and Vincent showed up to the garage, Harry refused to give him a car. An argument ensued between Vincent and Harry. The two argued until Vincent pulled the gun and shots rang out. Vincent shot Harry Buckbinder once in the chest and he died on the scene. Vincent went and hide. He got a room at 135 Barclay Street in Newark, New Jersey and hid out. Now, I'm trying to fill in some gaps here. We do know that this time the Ambergs had a business relationship with Siegel. Joey and Ben were partners in several dealings, and Pretty was a partner with Red Levine, a Bug and Meyer killer. These guys were all in the same Jewish mob, so to say, that operated alongside the Italian mob, the syndicate, so to say. Vincent Baccio had some pull 
but not enough. Two weeks later, Siegel found out where Vincent was staying in Newark. He headed over there with a team of killers that most certainly contained Pep Strauss, Pittsburgh Phil, and Abe Brellis. After forcing their way into Vincent's apartment, they subdued Vincent and forced him to make a phone call to his brother Anthony, telling him to get to Newark as fast as he could. Anthony Baccio grabbed Andrew Fabrizio and they headed over to Newark. The two came dressed like they were headed out for a night on the town. Both men wore blue matching serge suits and brown and white shoes. The outfits were identical down to the underwear. They climbed the steps and knocked on the Newark apartment door. The next day, Peter Wozenay came out to his yard to feed his pigeons in Harrison, New Jersey. He noticed the oil cloth a few feet away in a dumping ground. He thought that the tarp would be perfect for a boat cover. He walked over and pulled the tarp and an arm fell out and hit him on the foot. Rosenay ran and called the authorities. They found three sugar sacks containing the cut up pieces of Vincent Baccio. Andrew Fabrizio was stuffed into two sacks and rolled up into a rug. Both men had been stabbed multiple times with an ice pick, their skulls were fractured and they had lengths of clothesline around their throats. The next day, the body of Anthony Baccio was found by a couple walking in Long Branch, New Jersey. He was in a similar state, beaten, stabbed, tied up and shot. The cops arrested Harry Greenberg, Sam Castellano, David Kroger, and Charles Wolschewski in Brooklyn and charged them with the murder. I believe one of these is the alias for Ben Siegel because I got another source that says a youth name, Maya the Bug, Maya the Bug was one of the men arrested. The next day, Vincent's fiance, Olga Kashmir, went to the police and said that on the day of the bookbinder shooting, Vincent was picked up by a guy named Pretty. She said that before he went into hiding, Vincent was afraid of a guy named Maya the Bug. Pretty Amberg was arrested and charged with murder. Later, when Pretty walked on the charges, he had to be protected from the Baccio family as he left the courtroom. The Baccio mother had a bloody undershirt of Tony Baccio and was waving in the Pretty's face. You skunk, she said. You know whose shirt this is? It's Vincent's. At the family's pulled the Pretty's clothes, he was knocked down the courthouse steps and had to be escorted to a car by police. All the rest of the men had the charges dropped due to lack of evidence. One person knew who was behind it, Tony the Wop. He wanted payback. So shortly after 10 p.m. on November 10, 1932, Ben Siegel and seven of his pals were playing cards at 547 Grand Street. While they were laughing and joking, someone was on the roof lowering something down the chimney on a the rope. Then boom! Chairs, tables, and people went flying. The front wall of the building collapsed as well as the adjoining wall. The explosion was so loud it was heard for blocks. When the police arrived, they found Ben Siegel, Saul Silverman, and Harry Goldberg unconscious underneath the rubble. Ben had a fractured skull, Harry Goldberg had scalp wounds, and Saul Silverman had a fractured spine. These men were taken to the hospital and questioned, but they had nothing to say. Four others present were taken in, including a 29-year-old Red Levine. They too had nothing to say. And I'm pretty sure that Harry Goldberg was Harry Big Greeny Greenberg. All right. These guys use a lot of aliases. It's really hard to catch up to these guys sometimes. All right. Tony the Wop went into hiding and began to write his memoirs. He sent a copy to his lawyer, Philip Cooper, to see if he can get him published. Two weeks after the bombing, Tony the Wop secretly moved into his parents' homes at 6207 Fort Hamilton Parkway. At 7 p.m., Philip Cooper arrived with the typewriter, and Tony the Wop sat down to write. Until now, the people have been kept in ignorance to the real underworld. For instance, did you know that our underworld has a real 400? Just as our so-called society had. How can you become a member of the Underworld 400? First, you have to become a leader of great underworld power. Second, you must be recognized as a man of great wealth. Third, you must have political friends. Fourth, you must have the reputation for square dealings and money matters. Well, I am now an outlaw member of the Underworld 400 with a better reputation than any one of the members in the present circle. The only difference is I cannot attend meetings because I am on the spot. There will be one of the greatest celebrations in the underworld if I stopped fighting them and became a member in good standing. In conclusion, I don't mind telling you that the 400 voted a large sum of money to get me dead or alive, and my friends were forced to contribute towards that fund. At 8 p.m., there was a loud knock at the door. Tony's father went to answer it and found three men who said that they were detectives and they needed to speak to Frank. Tony the Watt rose from his typewriter and asked, what's all this about? The policeman said, are you Frank? Frank said, yes, what do you want? We want to talk to you. Tony protested, but after reassuring him that they only wanted to talk to him about Andrew's murder, he went to the alcove outside the apartment door. Tony had his back to the wall when one of the cops who wore a black overcoat and a blue fedora raised a revolver and shots rang out. 
Three slugs were pumped into Tony's chest. He slumped to the floor dead. The shooters fled down the stairs to a waiting blue sedan out front. His family ran outside the apartment when they heard the shots. Tony was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. The police seized his writings and would later say that it was nothing of importance. No names were named. No crimes were solved. They said it was just a fictional manuscript. Tony the Wop was just trying to make some money by telling gangster stories. But we'll never know. His notes were never published in full and somehow disappeared from the records. The police laid the murder of Vincent Cole on Tony the Wop and thought this was the reason for his murder. An hour later, a blue sedan was found abandoned in front of 4709 3rd Avenue with three revolvers on the floor. One of them had three spent shells. Gora Shapiro, Louis Lepke, and Pretty Amber were brought in, but with no evidence, they were all released. Ben Siegel had an airtight alibi. He was laid up in the hospital bed with pretty nurses who vouched for his presence. And that, my friend, is the skinny on the Fabrizio brothers and the first rat of the mob, Anthony Tony the Wop Fabrizio. I hope you enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. Make sure you bump off that subscribe button, break that thumb, ring that bell, set the notifications for everything so you don't miss nothing. If you want to slide an envelope upstairs, the link is down below. If you want access to the videos a little early and you want access to the uncut videos and the images I can't show you on YouTube, some videos have some images I can't show, some videos don't. But if you want that, you got to go to the Few Bad Men Patreon channel. All right, and subscribe over there. Also, the merch store is open. I don't know if you noticed. I've had some special requests for some shirts. I uploaded them, but they're still pending. If you do want a special shirt, a, a specific shirt, a specific gangster, or something like that, just leave it in the comments, and I'll see if I can accommodate that request. All right? So, this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean, and don't take any wooden nickels. I'll see you in the funnies.